Amen. It is the faith of our fathers, the living faith, that gets us through. And we want to be true to our father's faith until death. The people of God are called into worship this morning with words from Genesis chapter 28, verses 15 through 17. Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob woke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Happy Father's Day to all of you who follow in Jacob's footsteps and are the fathers of families, are the fathers of nations, are the fathers whom God has appointed. It's the 12th week of our online service here um, at the 4th Avenue Baptist Church. And yes, it is now permissible uh, to return to sanctuary worship as long as we hold to the safety guidelines and we meet at our 30% of our capacity. But after a survey of the immediate community of 4th Avenue Baptist Church, um, and that survey revealing that this community was not yet ready to return to in sanctuary worship. We will continue our online worship through the summer. And the plan now is to return to online worship the first Sunday in September. Now, um, this we're really incredibly blessed. We have leaders that are working on everything that must be done. You're not here, but the pew cushions have all been removed because it's difficult to sterilize cloth. We've made purchases of masks for those members who, were, when you return, wouldn't have a mask. We have sanitizers. We are ready um, for the return in September. And we are also grateful that as a Baptist church, that nothing supersedes the body, as my ancestors would say, and that the body has spoken and we will return in the fall. Now our return in the fall is predicated, um, and all our worship is predicated on the continued gifts of the community and our members, and we're grateful uh, for the faithfulness of this community, which allows us to continue to come before God's people in this time. We're grateful for those persons all over the world who listen to this worship and are hearing um, a word from God and we think being transformed uh, by that word. We got a notice this week of a young person who wants to be baptized and I need to let you know that I'm Baptist. But it ain't, it's not a doctrine and it's not an idol. And so I will baptize that young person in the next few weeks if they so choose. And we will do so in accordance with the safest procedures, which may not mean we get in the pool. But believe me, there'll be a lot of water. So pray with me as we go to that. I have some exciting news. Uh, Encore Fashions is reopening for the month of July. They're having a summer sale. And I am so impressed always with Encore Fashion. So if you're in Iowa, you need to come by here and uh, participate. Encore Fashions, 100% of everything they sell goes to charity. 100%. There's no other, uh, there's no, uh, other charity that does that. They've taken a lot of time to do social distancing. They're gonna wear masks. They have a whole set of procedures so it's safe and everything is gonna be on sale. So please, please, please come by. They'll be open Wednesday and Saturday, 10 to one. The people that work in Encore Fashions are the best of the best of the best, sir. So please come and check them out. We're grateful. And as you uh, continue to support this ministry, again, I got my little envelope, it fell on the floor, um, that says, use wherever needed. 
And of course, um, we're grateful for that giving and grateful for your giving. As you prepare your gifts for kingdom, hear Psalm 41.1. Happy are those who consider the poor. The Lord delivers them in the day of trouble. Let us pray. Ancient God, who is our heavenly Father, thank you. On this Father's Day, we know the love, patience, encouragement, strength, and compassion of a father by your example. Thank you for fathers and father figures who look to you and attempt to imitate and emulate the best of who you are while raising the children in their lives. Grant a blessing on all fathers, uncles acting as fathers, and men expecting to be fathers one day, so that they will always look to you as the goal and aim. All earthly fathers are not perfect or good. Still, we are thankful for the life they gave us and for those fathers who worked and loved to their best. Help men worldwide to set aside foolish pride and end the unnecessary use of patriarchy, misogyny, and violence against women and children in their communities. Women can only do so much. We need men fathers to stand in the gap. Merciful Savior, look upon the hearts of those who continue to be affected by violence. Our hearts remember five years ago, a gunman opened fire in a historic church in Charleston, South Carolina. Four years ago, a gunman killed 49 persons at the Pulse nightclub. Our hearts still bleed. This year, the continued spread of domestic attacks by police officers on North American soil are a daily reminder that humanity is off course and off track. Please help our hearts to be softened as we look at lasting solutions without name calling and finger pointing. There is enough blame to go around. What we lack is you. Pour your spirit upon us. Change us into your likeness and image. Compassionate sustainer, grant complete healing to our friends and family. Medicine and the medical profession can only do so much and go so far, but there is no limit to your power, your presence, and your healing abilities. Intercede on their behalf and bring about miracles in our eyes. Please use us as you will to be the earthly instruments of that healing. And while on others thou art calling, do not pass us by. And remember to encourage our hearts, clear our minds, and strengthen our hearts for the journey to come. And as we go from day to day, we will remember to give you honor, glory, and praise forever.
and we shall be changed in a moment. Amen. Our scripture today is from the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 20, verses 7 through 13. I'm going to read those verses, and I am almost positive you're going to want to reread them in other uh, translations. Jeremiah chapter 20, verses 7 through 13. O oh Lord, you have enticed me, and I was enticed. You have overpowered me, and you have prevailed. I have become a laughing stock all day long. Everyone mocks me. For whenever I speak, I must cry out, I must shout, violence and destruction, for the word of the Lord has become for me a reproach and a derision all day long. If you say, I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, then within me there is something like a fire shut up in my bones. I am weary with holding it in, and I cannot. For I hear many whisperings, terror is all around, denounce him, let us denounce him. All my close friends are watching for me to stumble. Perhaps he can be enticed, and we can prevail against him and take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me like a dread warrior. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble and they will not prevail. They will be greatly shamed for they will not succeed. Their internal dishonor will never be forgotten. O Lord of hosts, you test the righteous. You see the heart and the mind. Let me see your retribution upon them. For you, I have committed my cause. Sing to the Lord. Praise the Lord, for he has delivered the life of the needy from the hands of evildoers. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I am on battlefield, oh my Lord. battlefield for my Lord. <laughs> I have a confession to make. Sometimes I'm mad at God. Sometimes I am so angry with God, I scream and I cry and I shake my fist. I am so sick and tired of being sick and tired that I wish I could turn around, run away, and never speak to God again. Yeah. I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. I promised Christ that I would serve God till I die. <laughs> but sometimes, sometimes, and I believe that the prophet Jeremiah understood. Here in the 
30th chapter of Jeremiah, God's prophet offers a lament, prayer, confession, which is almost blasphemous. Jeremiah accuses God of being a deceiver in some translations, politically correct language for a liar, a seducer. Jeremiah ain't happy at all. The very polite and so-called politically correct of the biblical world shy away from the sexual language and image come conveyed in this text, but I will not. That's right. Jeremiah uses the language of rape because the prophet feels threatened, violated, betrayed, and misused by Yahweh, whom the prophet has pledged to serve. <laughs> now, I, I don't need to be graphic because any of you listening who have been sexually violated know exactly what this means firsthand. You understand the pain, the anguish, and the betrayal described. But since most rape victims are women, maybe the rest of us don't get it. So, try this. Oh Lord, you threw a rope around my neck and hung me from a tree. You stood by as the stump was kicked out from under my brown legs and watched. As I dangled in the wind, my eyes began to bulge, my legs shake, and you stood by silently. Or how about this one? Oh Lord, you were there when the man came into the nightclub that night exactly four years ago. The man unloaded hundreds of rounds of ammunition into the bodies of gay Latinx men and women who came out that night to laugh <laughs> with friends and to dance to great music. <laughs> you watched as we huddled in terror in the washrooms under tables that would not protect us. You, God, delayed the arrival and the intervention of law enforcement <laughs> as the assailant continued to kill and kill and kill. Or how about this one? Oh, Lord, you did nothing to protect me when those men snatched me from the bus stop that night. They dragged me down to Red River, violated my body, and called me Red Girl and asked if I had a headdress and if I lived in a teepee. Over 4,000 times since 1980, my sisters and I have cried out to you and you did nothing. Sometimes I'm angry with God. Can you tell? And I believe the prophet Jeremiah understands. God calls us, makes promises to us. Those promises don't seem to be materializing and we seem trapped. The lamentations of Jeremiah are very personal and they are also, believe it or not, very communal. The prophet is expressing the grief of an entire community. Saints, we have been given a glimpse into the 
conflict Jeremiah feels exists between the promises of God, the ones that God has made, and the reality that the prophet is witnessing. It's an age-old conflict. <laughs> it's a question of divine sovereignty and human freedom. Lewis Stolman looks at this dilemma and asks this wonderful question. Is life a collage of human choices, the product of superimposing divine program, or some combination of the two? Great question. Now, don't expect any final answers on this because this is clearly a place where scholars and other smart people absolutely do not agree. One camp would be represented by the author and poet Albert Camas saying freedom is, to choose is one's destiny and it's what sets us apart from every other living creature. The other camp has Soren Kierkegaard, who thought God blesses us with the ability to choose. And as believers, we accept a set of responsibility, moral obligations, and ethical freedoms. Good sounding academic gibberish. Except we, like the prophet, feel unable to exert ourselves against God who seems too large, too powerful, and ultimately in control. Choices and freedoms all seem to go out the window. <laughs> it made me think of this crazy uh, musical from 2009 entitled Our too short to box with God. The production, as it is named, explored the dilemma of human freedom and divine sovereignty. A spoiler alert, <laughs> God wins. They thought, that thought led me to the actual arm length of famous boxers, right? Arms too short to box with God. Tommy Hearns. Tommy Hearns had an arm length of 80 inches, which helped Hearns to win against Pepino Quavis, Jeff McCarkin, and Dan Ward, all whose reach was six inches short. And Mary Holmes, with a reach of 81 inches, who defeated Jamie Howe by a knockout in the first round. And I'm guessing because uh, uh, Larry had eight inches on Jamie. Or the great Sonny Liston, with a reach of 84 inches, who won the 1962, landed a knockout in the first round against Floyd Patterson, who had a disadvantage of 13 inches. <laughs> Jeremiah and I and most of you are in a boxing match with God, trying not to get knocked out in the first round, but our arms are too short. Our arms are too short to box with God. God always wins. So we moan a lot. We blame God. We bring our doubts, our fears, and our grief to God. We do not shy away from the tragedies present in our world or how our trust in God has weakened. We refuse to give in to the doctrine of modernity, uh, which prescribes history as a closed process where we must manage with the available pieces because there are no new pieces. We move from our despair slowly and partially to life where miracles happen and in Brueggemann's words are construed, celebrated, and confessed in astonishing faith. You see, this faith 
has been placed in our hearts by God. It is God who buried the prophetic word deep within us. It has an urgency which makes it impossible to hold back and even more difficult to contain. This prophetic urgency had Ezekiel see a multi-dimension wheeled chariot, made Elijah a wild man going up to heaven in a chariot of fire, had Amos and gave Amos the gift of irony, had Hosea sound like a script from a horror movie, and God as a raving and ravaging leper tearing out hearts and, and made Micah, <laughs> sweet Micah, uh, spoke of doing justice and walking humbly for, before God and then the not so nice Micah, tear the skin off my people, flare their skin off and break their bones in pieces and chop them up like me. <laughs> you see, Micah was the good and the bad interrogator. Jeremiah and others before and all of us since were called by God to help God's people live as if the kingdom of God is already here and God is already in complete control. The prophet is an unrelenting mediator of divine judgment. The prophet is the truth teller responding to domestic, economic, social, and international crisis. Our 21st century sensibilities would have us to believe that there must have been something special, uh, uh, something unique about Jeremiah which caused God to select him to be a prophet. Uh, but I got news for you, that's not so. <laughs> Jeremiah was an ordinary person with ordinary family and ordinary social liability. Just like you and just like me. In fact, <laughs> this is close to home. Jeremiah didn't even want the job and was very vocal about it. Jeremiah says, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. just a minute, God. Uh, uh, excuse me, look at me. Look at me, God. I don't know anything. I'm just a youngster. <laughs> but you know what? Jeremiah's excuses didn't mean anything to God. You know, we think we have a vote. That's what we think. We think this is a democracy between us and God. Uh, we get to vote on who God chooses, especially when we're the one being chosen. <laughs> God is the only one who gets a vote. God way will prevail with Jeremiah and with the nations, with you and with me. God will speak through whomever God chooses. And the same way God chose Jeremiah, through baptism, God has chosen each of us blessed us and given us a job to do. God's vote is like a fire shut up in our bones. And if your fire is singing, then sing and let the world hear the clean, clear notes of a voice God has given. If your fire is numbers, then add, subtract, and divide in a way Everyone will know that you are God's own. If your fire is words and prose, then write the story of God's people, big and small, recording for eternity the stories of, uh, of how we got over. Maybe your fire is a video camera, a saw, nails, you have a fire. God has given you a voice, a power. Use it. Use it. 
Whatever God has placed within you, it will not be contained. It will break out into the world and be a part of God's plan to open new spaces, possibilities, and opportunity for God's kingdom to grow. <laughs> like I said, sometimes I get angry with God. And I want to stop, drop, and run back to the hole God found me. But I don't. In some ways, I don't think I can. The fire inside calls me to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. To tell the story of one born to an unwed mother. A part of a people who had been oppressed and subjugated by a ruling and unruly empire. But even still, to have a man adopt her child as his own and together raise that child in a godly manner. And in the fullness of time, that child took the place that God had assigned and walked the dusty streets of Galilee. And every person who Jesus met, Jesus had love and acceptance, had power and compassion, had healing, had wholeness. Every single situation, it, when it came down to it, God said, I love you. And that wasn't enough. Jesus had to die and suffer because of that message. Because of a message of love and acceptance, Jesus was brought before a kangaroo court. Drummed up witnesses and convicted of the crime of being a child of the king. Crucified on a cross between two other convicted criminals. And even on the cross that day had enough power and compassion to say to one of those hanging there, you <laughs> will be with me this day in paradise. Die. Buried in a tomb that wasn't even God's own tomb. Two guards set on either side to make sure that the prophecy of resurrection would not come through. But I got news for you. Nothing stops the plan of God. So early on a Sunday morning, the stone was rolled away. And when the women came to see the dead leader, they met a risen God. And that risen Savior walked the streets and talked to many and ate with some and said, this is the power that I have from God and I give it to you. A new fire that will never be put out is yours today and always. That's the story I have to tell. I have to tell it to every single person I meet. I have to share it with every single community that I'm a part of. I'm trapped in this space with God. And it's all right. Join me. It's okay. Amen. Go with this blessing. You have been given a power a fire inside you from God. Go from this place and use your fire called position to bless, to encourage. It's all right to be mad at God. God can take it. Let the fire burn and scorch the earth with God's love. Hey, hey, hey.